Are you ready to embark on a journey of success? To discover your true potential in the untold stories of careers in life sciences. Welcome to Pathfinder by the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. With your host, Tommy Soares, discover the untold stories of industry scientists and unveil the secrets to excelling in your career. Thank you for joining us once again, and remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Welcome, everybody. My name is Tommy Soares. I'm Director of Scientific Strategy and Relations for the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. And today on Pathfinder, I have the pleasure of welcoming Shaili Sharma. Shaili is a Purdue engineering graduate and scientist. More than a decade after graduating with her doctorate, she has had the fortunate ability to pursue alternative and interesting career paths. Currently, she runs her own consulting business focused on strategy and innovation for early stage startups and large medical device companies. More recently, she led business development for Stryker Neurosurgery focused on identifying innovative companies and implementing growth strategies for the business, including M&A, distribution, and license agreements. Previously, she co-led an internal incubator within Stryker's neurovascular business, focusing on evaluating new clinical areas of interest to the company. And prior to joining Stryker, Shiley spent eight years working on the front end of innovation within roles in engineering at Cook Medical, leading a team of scientists and engineers at Purdue University and as an investment associate at GE Ventures. Shiley earned her PhD in biomedical engineering from Purdue University and a bachelor's in chemical engineering from the University of Minnesota Duluth. Shiley is also a Stanford Biodesign Innovation Fellow. Welcome, welcome to the program, Shiley. Thank you so much for being our Pathfinder today. Thank you for having me, Tommy. <laughs> this is awesome. I, I'm so excited to talk to you because it sounds like a rich adventure so far, and I can't wait to hear a little bit about how you got into it, how you were able to you know, go from graduating through Purdue Engineering and then creating a successful consultancy and a business development leader as you've become so far. And I uh, can't wait to hear it all. I guess maybe you could take us as far back as you want to take us and tell us how it all started. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I guess the thing I'll maybe start with is I never had a plan. If I looked back uh, five years ago or even 10 years ago and said, this is where I was going to be after my PhD, Never, it was never a straight plan. And I think that's what the wonderful thing about the journey uh, as well. <clears throat> I I got into engineering um, also by almost a choice I made deliberately. I am from born and raised in Nepal. And I went to, I wanted, you can go to medical school right after high school there. So I applied to a couple of medical schools there, uh, got into medical schools and then decided I did not want to be a doctor. I wanted to be uh, an engineer that could help provide, make tools uh, for doctors that didn't have solutions when they needed them. So that was the first pivot in what I thought was going, what my parents thought was going to be the perfect journey <laughs> uh, going forward. So that pivot sort of led me to be an engineer. Um, I did chemical engineering, like you said, and then biomedical at Purdue. And I actually specifically chose Purdue uh, because Purdue at that time was one of the very few institutions that really wanted to look into translational science and translational work. Uh, they they advertise it on their graduate programs and that's what excited me and that's kind of why I chose Purdue and also why I chose the professor that I worked for. She was also very, um, she that she had a track record of doing that, but she also, you know, when, when I'm on my one-on-ones would be uh, as interested in papers as she was in patents and <clears throat> just that type of work thinking around like, you know, academic work to be translated to help uh, Healthcare was something that excited me and it was the reason I joined Purdue. Um, 
And when I joined Purdue, I really didn't know which direction it was going to go. Um, I, I, I didn't know if I was going to be a professor or if I was going to go into industry. Uh, the one thing I knew for sure was the project that I was working on. I wanted to start a company with it. I wanted to take it out of the lab. I didn't want the dissertation to just sit in the library after it's done and bound and, and it's black and gold and it's you know sits in there. I didn't. I wanted to. I wanted it to do something with it. And uh, luckily, Alyssa um, had two other postdocs in the lab that also were very passionate about it. And I actually, I, I'm from Nepal, born and raised, and. When I finished my PhD, I was um, I, I had the option to work for a large company or start to join a very small company that was sort of starting off the ground. And this is now 12 years back. And at that time, immigration lawyers, you know, mentioned to me that it wouldn't be advisable if I wanted to stay in the United States to start a company with no revenue, no employees, nothing to sort of support yourself. Um, you should go do uh, you should go join a large corporation. And that's what I did. So I. Um, the technology was licensed out by Simic Biomedical, and they went on to do great things. Uh, the two postdocs from the lab uh, took the technology forward, and I sort of went the other direction of doing what anybody in industry thinks they're going to do as a PhD. Uh, started with R and D, bread and butter work, um, learning how to be an engineer. That's that was the first pivot. I can sort of go on because it's a long journey. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, as far, if you want to keep going, I'm I'm all ears. It's it's really great so far. It's a great story so far, I'd, and I want to hear more for sure. Yeah, no. So I so after you know when I was doing engineering work, um, I I I loved it. I loved working at Cook Medical. Um, it was my first exposure to a uh, medical device corporation and how they work under a quality system. I was I was a sponge to say the least. I you know when you graduate with your PhD program, a PhD degree, you sort of think that you know you know a lot, and then you, the world comes come you come crashing down when you realize you know very little. <laughs> about how medical devices are actually made in practice yes. and how they're brought to the marketplace. So it was a it was a tremendous opportunity. I also just started recognizing some things in myself of like, you know, I love the technical aspect of things, but I really cared about these bigger questions around why is this a problem? Who cares about this problem? Who's going to pay for this problem? And how are we going to get this to market? And that ended up being a very commercially oriented questions uh, and people advised me to go get an MBA, and I did not want to do any more schooling. After a PhD, nobody wants to do any more school. Um, so I decided, no, the skills that I, uh, one of the things I had done during my PhD was the prep program at Purdue. So I'd written a business plan um, for my dissertation work, which in, one, in itself for me was a mini MBA because I was, you know, I had come up with a marketing plan. I had come up with a profit and loss statement for what the business would love to look like, the projections, things that I thought an, at least an entry level MBA person would be telling me to do. Um, I'd already kind of done that. So I didn't want to go do that. And I thought if there was business things that had to be learned, I could do I could do it on the job. So instead, what I did is um, I decided to make the second pivot or second pivot, I suppose, uh, into trying to go into a more commercially oriented role. I didn't really have uh, an idea of how I was going to do it. I I'd heard about the Biodesign Innovation Fellowship, and I wanted to be a part of it uh, because it taught a lot of the things that I believed in about like paying attention to the market first and understanding the market before you try to put the technology forward. And that program uh, helped me pivot. So I sort of sometimes say that was my one year in marketing, uh, if you will, it gave me the credentials, if you will, to sort of make a pivot. And I joined Stryker um, right after that program. And uh, I joined Stryker actually on the business development team to help them assess new areas to get into. And then from there, took on a leadership role to help them strategize and uh, I, or due diligence on companies that they wanted to buy. <clears throat> so that was the journey that led me from engineering to a more business, a business world. And since uh, since then, what I've been interested in doing is, you know, I've spent a decade working at large corporations and uh, they they definitely have a good way of doing things. But I had this itch of wanting to work at a smaller company. I wanted to work. At, I wanted to start one. There was another time that I was at Stanford that I wanted to start another one. And it just never was coming to fruition. So I decided to take this plunge, this leap um, of trying to identify a smaller company via consulting. So consulting as a means uh, to identify, but also consulting as a means to do interesting work. Because one of the things I was noticing was people were, uh, the companies that I was approaching with the ability to do BD for them 
or, you know, look at what they could do next after their first product launch, they were kind of not able to pay in some ways. So they wanted to, they wanted somebody, but they wanted somebody part-time. And I was like, this could be a good consulting arrangement where we try before we buy. Uh, we both sort of like, you know, so I have two type of consult consulting clients, if you will, at any given time, a large corporation and a small company, and both of them have very different um, objectives. Mm-hmm. So that's in a nutshell, I guess, where I'm at. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is awesome. And what a what a trajectory too. I want to hear, uh, there's so much I really want to hear, uh, but I, I want to hear a little bit about like your application to Striker, or did did you apply, or did they recruit you to to work in the company? So Striker, I got lucky. Striker Neurovascular um, is based in Fremont, which is about twenty miles from Stanford's campus. Um, they had, like I like to say, drank the biodesign Kool Aid, and they really believed in that philosophy, and they wanted to bring people in house to help them with their innovation processes, not only in their current product development, but help them think about where else should we go. So I was at the right time, at the right place, um, able to do the task that they needed me to do. Okay. So, it, and was that like, was that like at a conference? Uh, were you showing a poster? Were you at Stryker because Stanford had done something, some activity? What was that like? So Stanford, um, Stanford, the biodesign program held, holds an executive education program, um, and the executive education usually they invite uh, people from different companies. So Stryker had come in; <clears throat> their president, vice president uh, of R and D, BD, had sort of come in the very first year and gotten trained. This was before they even knew me or I. Like you know, the very first introduction to biodesign, I think, was there. And then they just kept getting exposure through that program, and they started recognizing as more and more of their people got got trained how how valuable it was and how they wanted to bring it in house that's really really neat so do you, i mean do you recommend these programs then for people like as you said that have this itch to maybe start something new on their own some new startup or or learn about it at least um, the biodesign program, yes, I would recommend it to um, anybody interested in medical innovation. It is I, it is not only to start a company. I think what it teaches is a language uh, vocabulary that you can use uh, anywhere in medical innovation. So like I use that as a way to teach larger corporations how to think about innovation. Some other people, my colleagues, used it as a way to start a company. Some other people took it back to their training as residents or physicians uh, in practice and th- th- thought about improving their own practice. So there's different ways you can use it. And I think it's a great program. Nice, nice. And what about this prep program you spoke about at Purdue? I know it was Really, for those people that were entrepreneurial or at least had some entrepreneurship uh, in their blood and wanted to take innovations out of the university, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that program was is, was instrumental in sort of the direction I took after my PhD. And the reason I say that was so I think I was the very first prep fellow. I don't I, there were two in the university and I was the first one. Um <clears throat> It was great because, you know, it took like the scientists like myself, a scientist student like myself, out of their day to day, thinking about experiments, thinking about the paper, and then force them to sort of think about what's happening outside the world. How would you even take this to practice? Like, you know, and I liked it because those are the things that I was interested in. And but it really did force me to sort of think about um, just you know, I was very surprised that until that time, I had never actually seen. So I, I was working on cartilage repair uh, for arthritis as my PhD. And before that, before doing that, I had never seen a physician actually do a cartilage repair. And yet here I was spending four years of my life uh, trying to design this technology. Right. So just that thinking of like, you know, you need to get into the clinic and understand how it's done today, because if you're going to make a paradigm shift, it better fit into what they're doing, or it better be really good that they're going to change what they're doing, you know? So I think that uh, just that thinking uh, was also sort of introduced there and just around a lot of other things too, right? Like when I, when I think about 
making the molecule itself. Like, how was it going to be packaged? How was it going to be? It was. It, how was it going to be delivered? Who was going to take it? How were they going to? What was? What were you going to charge for it? Things that you never think as a PhD student. I think um, that program just helped build the business thinking, if you will. Um, and then also because I had to, I worked with an MBA student, but uh, also just build a certain level of business ac acumen that I didn't have um, coming out of my PhD. And working with that MBA student, did that did that change your perspective? Uh, how, tell us a little bit about that interaction of you having to work with an MBA student to develop a business plan, and here you come speaking the language of science and uh, cartilage repair, or at least tissue culture, or whatever it might be, right? And uh, now you got to explain to him, or they have to explain to you what the whole business side of things is going to have to be like uh how was yeah that? no i mean if i think back to then my my uh my peer then was randall fees who was uh who's the mba student and we learned a lot from each other you know like i had to distill down from scientific terms into layman terms what i was trying to do and then he had to teach me what the what that meant in a business uh in, in the business world so i think there was a lot of learning for myself on the business side, but also how to articulate an idea so that it gets across to somebody that's not knee deep in um, arthritis. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And and to tell us, was it shocking the business side of things? Did you did did it come naturally to you? I mean, how tell us about that experience of starting to learn your first business terms and starting to think and having that philosophy of being business minded when you're putting these things together. Yeah, I think, you know, um, the idea, so business sort of can be broken down into a lot of different functions. But when I think about it in, in terms of what that what, what we did in that business plan, marketing came very naturally because that meant understanding the customer and understanding how to approach the customer and understanding the space that I was operating in. <clears throat> I think that was fairly easy. I think things around like, you know, uh, building a PL, building a actual uh, financial, three financial documents, like those, it just, it, it wasn't, it was foreign, you know, but it, they weren't hard. They weren't hard. It's just, you needed to understand it in some ways, which is why after we did it, I refused to go to business school because <laughs> I was like, they're going to teach me the same thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Do you still feel that way though, Shaila? Do you still feel like you would not have ga gained uh, from going to business school? <laughs> well, I guess, you know, I, so I say to my family that my PhD gets me 15 seconds of credibility. So maybe that MBA would have gotten me another 10 more seconds. Um, so I think there is definitely something there. They de they teach softer skills in some ways and how to make things more rounded so take aside you know the business the the finance the numbers um they just they, i think they do teach templates if you will like you know how to make things that that are more like more routine to use so yes maybe in a different world there was a time when i was doing my phd i did look into um doing a phd with an mba um, and at then Craner didn't offer the dual program. They, I think they do now, um, but at that time they didn't. And Indiana University was offering like some sort of uh, combined program. And I did look into it. I just didn't do it. So if I had to go back, I maybe would have done it just to get the credentials. Nice. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think that that that's good advice, right? Like it's... Uh, there's certain set of skills that you do pick up uh, that we might not pick up through osmotic, uh, just osmosis in your PhD, mm -hmm. but but definitely I think there's uh, there's good traction to be gained uh, by even by the network ability or the networking opportunity that you have in doing some of these courses with the people that you go through in the courses too, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we went through that together and that yeah. bond that bond stays um and okay so do you have an mba tommy <laughs> no i don't i don't but i but i've gone through some you know advanced non you know non-profit uh, administration and and management training at the at at the public uh, the school of public health and at iu and 
you know, going through that course, the people that went through that course together with me, there's some connection. We're still connected in some way and LinkedIn and in Facebook and stuff like that. And you feel some kind of a camaraderie that you went through this uh, experience together. And maybe, I don't know if that, if it's the same, same way at business school, but I could think, you know, people that go through their MBA together and stuff like that, they have that kind of, or executive MBA program. They have their, that kind of uh, experience too. Um, tell us a little bit though, was it daunting to go, on your own and say, well, I, I have this idea. I have this uh, idea that I could be, I should be a consultant, but you had gone through all of this work and experience at Stryker already. And uh, did you, did you have some doubts or were you always uh, confident that ah, no matter what happens, I'm going to, I'm going to be okay. No, full of doubts. <laughs> full of doubts. If it was that crystal clear, I would have made a jump a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I think it was, you know, it was sort of presented itself as um, as a bend in the road, a fork in the road, if you will. And almost as a time where I, I, I caught myself talking to friends and saying I really wanted to be a part of a small company several times. <clears throat> and yet here I like, you know, I, I wasn't doing it. So it felt like if you were going to do, if I was going to do it, I had to take a risk. And the risk I took was, you know, I didn't have any clients when I started it. I didn't know if it was going to work. So I didn't know, um, I didn't know anything when I jumped ship, if you will, um, and decided to go in that direction. And um, I think if I hadn't done it that way, uh, who knows where this will go? This might be the worst decision of 2023. But um, hoping that it continues. And, you know, like, I think it's sort of an all in, right? Like I've decided I'm going to do it and there's no, no going back. And I've decided an exact way of doing it. And I'd like to believe that no decision is final. Like, you know, so it, it doesn't mean that if it, if, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't mean that it was a bad decision. Um, I love that. I really, really like that. I was just talking to a friend about that is that, there is no way you can make a bad decision because not you know you just learn from every experience that you've had. Um, whether at the end you think, well, I could have made that decision better or not, that's a different question. Uh, but I really love what you just said, and and I want the audience to really listen carefully to that because every every bit is part of the adventure in life right and you get something good something bad i'm sure out of every bit uh tell us a little bit about that moment where do you have a moment where you said no now i'm taking the leap i've been working in this large company but i've always wanted to work in the small company i've always wanted to do it uh, is it because you get to play a bigger role in the smaller company? You get to play more different roles, v variety of roles? Yeah, no, you know, for a while, I actually had to define what small meant. And uh, when I was at Stryker, I sort of, um, I thought 400 people was small. Um, you know, and now I've come to the realization that small really is less than 50 people, like zero, one, two, 10, 20 is, is more yes. as what a small company is. And yes. the type of things that they need done are very different. They're incredibly hard to find, but they're also, you know, you're either a functional expert and they find you. But if you want to find them, you have to sort of show value to them in a certain way that you can bring to their team. And, um, you know, you enjoy what you do, but at the same time, they their work gets pushed forward. So trying to find that fit at a, such a small company is really hard, is really, really hard. And I think consulting as a way, as a way to sort of do interesting work, but also try before you buy. Like, you know, you try the company, they try you, you see if the work is interesting. And if not, you move on, you go to another client, you do something else. And at the end of the day, you learn something new, working with a new set of people and you you area, um, maybe even a whole new subject matter, right? Like, so I think it's, uh, that's how I at least am planning to approach it. Yeah. And what, what would you say would be, you know, the top three things that you learned at Stryker that you're still carrying with you that you're like, this is, this is something that I'm, I'm bringing to the table. Um, 
Let's see. Um, so I think the biggest thing really is how to think like a big company, mm. how to think like a big company and how to think about uh, not just how like so if if it's on the M&A front or if it's on like, you know, a partnership type of front, how do they think about innovation and how does it trickle throughout the organization? I think that's the number number one. So how are decisions made on that front? The number and two so is even even if we're talking about a small startup company giving them the legs, giving them the vision to think big, to think like a larger company. Everybody's exactly. Coca-Cola. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like how do they think? How do they see what you present? How do they how do they approach a certain uh, new idea? Like, you know, what is their process of what would they like to see on a screen when you talk to them for the first time? Um, things like that, um, mm -hmm. I think are are just on the BD side. And then just I've spent a, a ton of time on R&D as well. So how do they set up these processes? How do they get to be known as, you know, a very as 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 a large company that has a big target on its back, if you will. Right. Like, how do they do things the right way in, in a certain way? Because they've set up a standard and everybody has to follow that standard. So somebody that's trained in that in that manner, I think, is able to bring that to the table um, um, for sure. And then I think the other side is just. Uh, Striker has given me a lot of opportunity to sort of flex my muscle in different areas, if you will, right? So I came in, even though I came in BD, I did a lot of BD, but I was also in like, I kind of did what people called extreme upstream marketing for a while. I did a lot of things that people might call like, you know, very early stage discovery work, right? Like, so trying to put all of that together provides like a, a person with a lot of, um, what do you call that? A, a lot of jack, jack of a lot of trades, right? So like being able to have a lot of verticals that I can work on and not being typecast into like just one person, I think is very valuable, especially for a team very, very small. Um, and, I, and that only came because I'd worked at a larger corporation for a long period of time. And so, and so that, I mean, that must keep you so entertained because you have all these different verticals that you can, work on and a variety of different things on a daily basis is that right yeah it yes. it, it definitely is yeah it, it's it's fun and fascinating and it's it's just the it's the type of work i love to do where it's not just one one very single domain where where you are they call them the t individuals right the t individuals the m and the w whichever alpha letter you choose yes. where they have many areas that they sort of um, are experts in versus one deep area yeah, no, that's awesome. That that's so good, and it must keep again set your day very exciting too, because you get to work on all these areas uh, almost sim simultaneously, or at least you know get get to pick and choose which ones you work on during the day, right? Yeah. Um, Shelly, tell us a little bit. You know, if if somebody is thinking. After their PhD, I just want to take what I got from my PhD and I want to start a company with this. Just kind of like how you thought. What would you say to them today? Straight out of their PhD? Yes. <laughs> just like um, you wanted to. I mean, I would say make sure, like, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm a mentor for another program uh, fellowship at Stanford or at Purdue right now where I do talk to people that are interested in taking their ideas forward. And it still amazes me and it, it, how technical we are as PhD scientists. We care about so much about the day to day of how to make an experiment work, which we should. It's our, it's our, it's our bread and butter, right? Like how to make an experiment work with the, the scientific discovery around it is what occupies our mind all the time. Yeah. I would sort of say, in addition to that, understand the marketplace that this is going to go into. Uh, so take like for the bare minimum, go and see if it's a medical procedure or a medical diagnostic implant, whatever. How is it being done today? Understand that without even thinking about your technology, like forget about what you're working on for a few days and go and observe, go and be a shadow in a clinic, go and observe and see how it's done. I think the learning from understanding the point of view of where you think that could go is tremendous because then it'll also add to what you're already working on, but you'll understand that the problem is going to be a lot bigger than just perfection in the science in some ways. So I would say initially try to understand the customer, try to understand the market, try to understand uh, 
how this is even going to play out. And then I would take advantage of the programs like the prep program to help create these business plans, right? Like it seems daunting at first, but enrolling in a program where the output deliverable is a business plan competition helps you, forces you to do the work, I think. So like once you do that, you get more comfortable with then saying, oh, I could go to Rice's business plan competition. I could go to the MIT business plan competition. You start becoming more comfortable talking about your idea to a large group of people in a business way. So I think just taking that first leap would be the first thing to do. And then building a network while you're doing that, building a network with the people that you're talking to. Like, you know, nobody's going to write the first check after the first pitch. It's going to take a very long time to raise money. So like trying to continuously talking about it and uh, making people know that, about what you're working on, I guess. Yeah, that's start. Yeah, but I can totally. be the expert because I haven't started a company yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I like I like the way that you put it. I mean, you have to start and you have to start with your first foot forward. You know, we I, sometimes you look at these buildings that are huge, they're so tall, and you realize, well, they had to start with one brick uh, at, at some point in time, right? Yeah. Um, and and I think people get, get they, they dream about that future, what, what the building is going to look like once they build it, but to realize that the first brick has to be placed and it's got to be placed properly uh, to continue going and, and, and focus on, on that aspect. What are some of the techniques that have given you, you know, the success, let's say at Stryker that, that you thought, you know, my gosh, I, I was really able to use these types of techniques, whether they're soft or they're actual, you know, techniques for organization or man day to day management, whatever, whatever you thought that uh, we could we could put here out on the program that you think people could be could find useful. I mean, I think that so for the program and the audience, just like who they are and being set the scientific background that they have, being a critical thinker goes a very long way in business, no matter where you're going. It goes far because the skills that I honed, I didn't realize this at that time as a scientist, were are skills that I still use today around like, you know, diving deep, discovery, investigating, keeping an open mind, like, you know, knowing how to interpret results. Like, and it doesn't matter which area you throw me into. If it's a brand new area I've never known anything about, it's very easy to come up to speed because of that critical thinking background. I think the first year as a PhD student, our first class was critical thinking. I hated it. It was, we had to go through these papers and like talk about why the papers were bad or good or like, you know, yeah. and it was, I thought it was so hard. And at times I was like, why are we doing this? But that skill I still use today. I use reading a paper in a very critical eye today. And it was the very basic foundation of the program. So that's one I would say for sure I use almost on a daily basis. Uh, the other thing that I think is important for somebody thinking outside of academia in some ways is to understand when when something that you're working on is a science project and when it is an when it can turn into an application. And there's a very subtle line, I think, like, you know, because you can keep asking the why questions. You can keep asking the, the questions that will add to scientific uh, body of work and, and it's very interesting as a scientist to continue doing that but there has to, there is a line where it becomes an application and you have to stop doing it so I think that is a skill that you learn on the job almost like you know you have to start thinking about it that way once you graduate but then the more you do it the better you get and you know I I like that too because I I think somebody told told me this uh, as a question to ask which is, is it good enough uh, to put out there as an application? And, and you know, because if you think about it, uh, for a lot of products that are there, uh, out there, a lot of them are not optimum products, but they are good enough products to do the job. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> as my first job is in our, R&D engineer, um, I sat in a research meeting, uh, this was an industry, and they presented results, and the end, the sample size was three, 
And I was appalled. I was like, how can you draw statistics with a sample size of three? And that's sort of the question that I had right in my mind. And then I started realizing that it was, they weren't trying to make big claims. They were just trying to quickly get through ideas. And then as you progress, so then as you progress from discovery to kind of like a design history file, which is a very, uh, a very strict process in medical device, a very regulated process, right? Then your sample size is going to increase and it's going to be very targeted on a specific topic, right? So then I started realizing the way academia and industry was so different, right? Like I, I initially thought that they were, they were, they were if I had just kept my scientist hat on, I would have kept pushing that end and saying, you need more numbers. You need to show yeah. like, you know, more results there. But their their difference was they were doing it a little bit later. Yes. Yeah. That's so interesting. And that's awesome to know about because we we don't realize those, uh, those are even cultural uh, differences, right? Is it, okay, it's good enough for this question. All right, on to the next question. Let's get a little deeper into this. We saw what we needed to see, and then let's go. I like that. I, I think that, you know, we don't do that at all in academia. It's all, all the big experiment, lot, lots of numbers, lots of uh, statistical power in your in your experiments, right? Yeah, it's... Yeah, there's, there's a lot of testing that does go on in, um, like, you know, when a device is put forward. Um, and and just like you said, and like, you know, there's different things they'll test, many different things. And all of those will have their own sample sizes. And, and then you sort of keep pushing it forward. That's that's great. That, that's good to know. <laughs> it's good to hear. Uh, Shelly, tell us a little bit also about soft skills. What are some of the techniques that to help us build soft skills in working either with other people or in teams or with industry and maybe even bridging this cultural divide, right? Like how do we not shock ourselves getting into that system and saying, wait a second, that doesn't sound like it's scientifically sound uh you know experiment unless you're going to you know test 10 people at least or whatever you know because we i'm sure we get into trouble with uh, with ourselves and and our peers and when we come across like that and in, into this type of cultural situation that's that's a tough question <laughs> um i think you know the best the best way that i've learned is to sort of just um so to kind of understand the other, other party first, understand their motivation. And this has been, um, I mean, it's a, it's a lesson in leadership as well, just like understanding what motivates other people. And it's not always, I've learned, it's not always uh, the best outcome or like, you know, the best results or like the, be like the best sort of criteria is not what motivates everybody. Some people are motivated by different aspects and understanding what motivates them helps bridge trust. Yeah. So I think those two connected is like what is how relationships and team in teams or even outside of teams are, are made. And mm -hmm. it takes time is the other thing I've, I've learned, you know, even within Stryker. So I spent five and a half years at Stryker. I moved from uh, neurovascular to neurosurgical. And when I moved to neurosurgical, my first week there, I, it felt like a completely new company to me. So I felt like I was an outsider, even though I'd worked at Stryker for already three years. Um, and it was, it was, I had to sort of, you know, take my, take my neurovascular hat on and try to understand these new people and understand what motivated them and, um, and building, building trust and people like to build trust in different ways, right? They like to build trust by getting together often by having common touch points by sharing similar hobbies, like just understanding what they are. And I don't think there is a need to fit the mold. I think you just sort of go and be who you are. Yes. Um, and you find your mold and you be genuine, right? Like, and you build that relationship and that trust over time, basically. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's so, it's so real. It's, and it's so true that it takes, it takes some time, but it's all those touch points that you have to uh, keep, keep an effort up on uh, to, to build the trust that with the people that you are working with. Um, any mentors that you encountered at Stryker that taught you some of the ropes, uh, some of the 
the the words of wisdom that are coming out of your mouth today? <laughs> um, no, for sure I did. I had different people along the way and they taught me different things. So my direct manager, um, both at both neurosurgical and neurovascular, both were, were very good in trying to, you know, <clears throat> help me think about how I should articulate myself more and how to like how the ways of that industry or that business unit worked and what I needed to do more of and less of because they trusted me and my scientific knowledge, but they wanted to help develop these soft skills, um, which I think were, were great. I also had a tremendous uh, woman leader within the company that that kind of showed me how to be like, you know, how to say yes or no to certain things and like stand up for yourself or not stand up for yourself in certain situations. When to stand up, I guess is a better way to say it. When to stand up um, and just observing that and um, that that had been pretty good. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. And um, I mean, it was it ha has it been something that just came naturally to you in, in terms of some of these uh, suggestions? What, what are some of, give us an example, if you can, uh, of some of the soft skills, uh, for example, that, that you think were important for you to hone in on? Um, so I guess, you know, we talked about motivation. So motivation. So I, I was motivated by let's go, let's go, let's go, let's create the best, um, best document, best presentation, like, you know, why would you try to do the best? And there, um, or, you know, I was sort of motivated by that. And I was also motivated by data. So if there, if the data is telling you the story, then why aren't you following the data? Like if I'm telling you, like, so that was a, that was an area that I didn't understand how somebody if I presented something to you, why didn't you see exactly what I saw? Like, you know, so then I understood from that, you know, it took a couple of months, years almost to try to understand that they were motivated, not by the data, but they believed in the story if somebody that they trusted told them to believe in it. So then I realized I had to go earn the trust of that other person. And maybe it wasn't directly this one person that I was talking to that was like, you know, they needed the, uh, this other person's buy-in, if that makes sense. So what motivates people is is extremely important to understand if you can, like what, um, and then try to help them in that way. I think that was, that was the first. I think some of the other ones are just around, um, some of the feedback I'd gotten earlier in my career was, uh, I take a lot of time to digest information and don't provide opinion right away. <clears throat> and I think that's just the nature of being a PhD. You you want to understand everything before you say anything, right? And um, in in industry sometimes, and I think it's, it's probably true in academia too, is you could be seen as somebody, it could be seen as you don't care or you don't care to participate or you're too shy. And it's it was neither for me. I wasn't shy and I did care to participate. Right. But there was there was this uh, somebody gave a feedback saying, if you had that opinion, why didn't you speak up? And I was like, well, I wasn't sure. They're like, do you think everybody that spoke up was sure? You know, like so that um, just that just knowing that it's OK to speak up and provide an opinion and you don't have to be like you don't have to it doesn't have to be 100 percent correct. You can just say it's an opinion and you're still. Uh, you know, you're still validating it, um, but your opinion counts, your opinion matters. So like that voice, uh, raising that voice. It's so hard. true. It's so true. Do you think you'll miss that type of dynamic though? Uh, or do you have, do you have uh, some of that dynamic in the meetings that you have now? Or is that um, mainly in a company type of dynamic culture? Uh, no, so I think it's it's definitely built. It, it, it was something I built there, um, but I hope to continue. Right, like I'm as a consultant, I I I don't care. I if they don't like my opinion, so maybe I'll be more opinionated uh, in some ways. Um, but it's something that I know that I have to continue to voice, especially with the clients where there's a lot of heavy hitters on on if they're on the meeting and they don't like to hear, and I I want to keep my voice out. I shouldn't. I should voice it right. Like so, it's something to be to be heard is very important. I think. Um, yeah, absolutely. And especially because they're they're hiring you, right, to get your opinion, to get your take on things. Um, and a lot of that sometimes is opinion that is based on research or years of experience. And that's that's where what it comes down to. We we tend to undervalue our experience, right, mm -hmm. Shadley? I think. And even as grad students and postdocs, we tend to 
undermine our own opinions as being well secondary because we're not the professor or principal investigator or whatever it might be but i think it, a lot of times that as you said we need to find that courage to find that voice and speak it out uh when you like something when you don't like something um i've also heard it's it's great to voice uh you know encouragement and and words of either gratitude or admiration for other people that are around in the team because that also makes people like you more uh if you if you don't reserve your nice comments uh to people about people as well um but it was so interesting that you said there was this way of either convincing or persuading people to buy into your either idea or your what you know you you were putting forward um and that skill set is so important to is understanding how people are motivated as you said to be inclined to go in one direction or another direction and and i find that that uh that continues to be a big struggle for a lot of people that want to sell their ideas right um tell tell us a little if you can just parting words on that because i think it's it's important as a as a point of human psychology and human persuasion and right? uh, how how we have to uh, present ourselves uh, to other people. Uh, so I'll I'll do maybe do two short like examples, right? Like when you think of medical device innovation, um, you have there are a lot of different stakeholders that you have to convince, and uh, in order to convince those different stakeholders, you have to understand everyone's motivation. You have to understand what they currently are doing that they'd like to change. Uh, and you also kind of under need to understand their hurdles. So there is this sort of psychology analysis for each stakeholder that you have to do regardless uh, if you want to be successful. I think that's first. But even at home, the second example I was thinking while you were talking is I have a three and a half year old. I, in order to make him do things that I want him to do, I need to understand his point of view. <laughs> I need to understand what is bothering him. I need to understand um, why he thinks a certain way. And when I do, I feel like our struggles are shorter um, yes. because there's, there's an understanding. <laughs> totally, totally. So there is this point of empathy also to get yourself down to understand people's point of view, right? Uh, so important. Shaili Sharma, thank you so much for telling us a, a little bit about your story, uh, MedTech Innovation Strategy and Business Development Now Consultant, and uh, wishing you the best of success in this new endeavor. And thank you so much for imparting these words of, of wisdom on us. And uh, telling us a little bit about how it goes in the world of consultancy. My pleasure, Tommy. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for joining us once again. And remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel.